Um, hello and welcome to this time team get together. Um, very pleased to be contributing to the CBA um, climate change and environment discussion. Um, I suppose when you think about time teams, we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, in that great, in that body of work that you all were all involved in, what as a body of work could that contribute to some kind of future discussion about the environment and climate change? It doesn't seem an obvious connection in some ways. But then I was thinking that two of the early programs we did, um, series three, um, was Stanton Harcock, where we were dealing with mammoths. And we have that, had that wonderful expert on beetles who could see the changes in the insect life over time. And then not long after that, we were effectively doing Soho Mint, which seems like the other end of the environmental situation with factories in Birmingham churning out carbon dioxide by the ton and producing millions of coins to go all over the world. So in one way, you can see how that happens. Um, I wondered how each of you, perhaps beginning with a time team or beginning from your current interests, see archaeology and the environment and climate playing in. Carenza, if you would like to start. Yeah, well, I, I'm sort of worked mainly in medieval period and, and rural settlement villages and things, as you know. And um, I guess the, the time team that has most resonance for me for that is our High, high Wursel. Um, in Yorkshire, which was a deserted medieval village and a sort of classic example of that type really in that it was on quite high ground, it's a slightly sort of more remote location um, and you know there are hundreds of deserted settlements across the UK, uh, thousands if you include all sort of small farmsteads and so on, um, many of which were only viable when the climate was sort of uh, benevolent and in the medieval period there's the medieval warm period between you know about 800 and 1200 AD and then there is a period of natural climate change people are debating and people are researching now as to whether actually that might have had some man-made contribution to it because certainly even in the medieval period yeah, you know the there's quite a lot of um, impact on the environment but certainly you know we know from all sorts of evidence that the climate was changing it was becoming cooler and wetter and many of these settlements were just either not sustainable or sufficiently difficult to make a living from but if people could move they did um, and then of course you get something like the black death comes in which um, for all its awful mortality um, did open up a load of vacancies in settlements across well the whole of the whole of the old world really I mean we now know that black death extended from you know Japan to Ireland um, and um, so people can move away from these places and you get these ghost villages really that are very much the product of climate change doubly so not only because it became difficult to farm them but also because climate change was actually a factor in kicking off the black death pandemic anyway because it kicked off a whole load of domino effect of changes to do with marmots in the russian step which was one of the factors so High Wurzel, when we were digging there, it was great for me to be digging on a deserted medieval village, which is sort of thing I worked on for a long time. But you do have that sense of those kind of lonely spaces where the people moved away because climate had changed. Uh, so archaeology can tell us about that sort of impact of climate change. Um, and of course, there's also the point about where medieval settlements are is generally relatively resistant to flooding. For example, if you want to know whether to buy a house, check whether there's any medieval pottery kicking around. It's probably a safe bet. Then. That's a very good point. And if, <laughs> and if in that way, climate change had that natural background to it, I think, Stuart, you've been doing a lot of work and experience where some of the activities we've been up to uh, at various times through our history in archaeology, we're seeing the effect of fairly large scale industrial processes. And what effect is that having on the landscape, particularly in the north, for instance? Well, it was interesting that Carenza mentioned flooding there because, it, in a way, that, that sparked my research interests in that area. And that I was asked some years ago to look at the impact of flooding. Uh, what they call precipitation events, the Environment Agency, which means very, very large downpours and snow melt and so on. But what was happening in the in the North 
Pennines, where you've got large amounts of peat uh, and the need to retain carbon stock and so on. And so water was flushing off the highlands, running into the valleys, washing through lead mining remains, and then the residues that were sweeping down valleys, threatening houses and, and washing away roads. And eventually the pollution from the lead and the zinc was ending up in, in the river systems. Uh, and, and I was asked if we could look at how we might identify whether this was just purely a result of climate change or, or were any other factors involved? In other words, how humans have managed the, the landscape and what impact they might have on it. But to cut a very long story short, um, um, in effect, what it led to was a very large research project to try and use new methods to identify the impact of human activity on the landscape and, and see how it had changed over time. Uh, and what it led to was the uh, kind of understanding from my point of view that archaeology isn't just about the past, but it can be very relevant to understand how we shape the future by looking at how we'd manage where you've got all these toxins going into the soil. How, how do we know where lead mining took place? What happened to all the, the residues that left the toxicity in the soil? And by using infrared um, imagery and LIDAR, new techniques then, we found this very rapid way of looking for the spectral signatures of toxic waste on the ground. And this was mining that had taken place since the Roman period, right through the medieval period, right through to the Industrial Revolution. And we were able to identify the sources of pollution that the Environment Agency knew nothing about by taking a large scale landscape approach to, to a, a subject. Uh, and not only were we able to identify sources of pollution and the impact on the landscape, and how toxins were getting into the river system and into your and into your local beef and local fish and all that type of thing, but as a byproduct, we found hundreds of new archaeological sites which were just sitting out there waiting to be found. Uh, new Roman settlements, which told us all sorts about lost societies on on the uplands, which we knew nothing about. And what's interesting in in, in this period of of pandemics and the, the plague and in the historical context and so on is it's not just clinical uh, pandemics which cause changes to society you have economic pandemics as well when when industries die societies peter out and if you go up to North Pennines now we've had generations of settlers there since since the you know, Roman period and before that but go up there now and it feels like a deserted landscape and it's just as much economic change as it is clinical change. I think that that uh, rather uh, brings us to that particular mention of Romans that um, we've all looked at time team Roman sites like Turk Dean and things like that and remember them well um, but I, I think, Helen, it's it, it, that situation of feeling we're, we're in a rather nice society, we've got warm baths, we've cracked it, we've got ro Roman roads and everything, and yet that didn't last, did it? Uh, and um, why was that? And was it some reflection of climate change, the environment that changed things? Yes, well, that, that's a good question. And, and I, I, I think a lot of people might be surprised that the two sites that epitomise it for, for me, the two time team sites, are, are both in the Roman period. And I'm not known for my love of the Romans, but I think they're very instructive. And But it's not so much about climate change, necessarily, because although there was, there was a, I mean, there's obviously always a bit of climate variability, but what, what's going on at the moment is absolutely unprecedented. And therefore, I think it's difficult to look for specific help in the past because our knowledge of human history is obviously only you know a, a million a couple of million years at most and we've got levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we haven't seen for for more than a couple of million years so so uh, precise parallels are really difficult to use what i'm interested in more is looking at this general theme of resilience and sustainability that you can't sustain a settlement on very marginal land when when you're in the middle of small natural climate variability you can't sustain uh, extracting these toxic minerals and having the toxic waste 
Um, but you also can't sustain an economy that is based on growth. So say you take somewhere like Drum Lanrig, which is one of the first ones I ever did. And I remember Stuart really looking after me while saying, I don't think your boots are up to this place. You know, shouldn't you be getting some better boots? I said, oh, yes, I should, I should. I'm going to do this. Um, it, was a, it was a damp place in the south of Scotland, one of the furthest, uh, Roman, furthest north Roman forts that I know of. And the only way that you could push into those places uh, w with the Roman Empire was by using the army, obviously. So you have this wonderful thing, the army, which you think is going to make your life really easy. You can conquer places, you can extract uh, resources from them, you can be empire building. And then as the years go on, you realise that the, the army needs feeding, um, the army is, a, is dangerous, the army is, a, is, is a, um, parasitical almost on, on the places that you want to civilise. Um, and, and in fact, it becomes a drawback. It becomes something that you can't sustain. So it's rather like the use of fossil fuels. At first, it's absolutely brilliant. You can do all sorts of things you could never do before. And then you realise that you can't carry on growing and growing. So you, you have to keep taking more uh, land, more resources to keep paying your arm. And eventually you reach the edges. And it's not just in the Roman period where you can't sustain this growth. You see it in the Carolingian Empire. You see it all over the place. You see it in the British Empire. And that's what we're seeing now. The army is not our problem. We've got a different problem. And then the second one that really epitomizes it for me is, um, is the, uh, the, the Roman villa we did on the Isle of Wight, uh, where it was magnificent, as you say, central heating bathhouses, all this kind of stuff, you know, the full panoply of Roman civilization. And then we found little tiny scraps of fifth century pottery and everything had just collapsed because once you, once you have that, that civilization that's built on so many things like the army taxation, um, a specialized economy, surplus extraction, slaves, markets, once you can't operate that, once a little bit begins to fail, like the, like the monetary system, the whole thing comes crashing down because you're not resilient. And the, um, the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers, you know, they're the epitome of resilience. They, like Carenza says, if you can move, you do. It's these cities of the last 200 years that have put on estuaries, uh, that, are, that, are, that are built on incredibly complex systems. It's us all being reliant on the internet and the internet of things. And you know, what happens if you lose the internet for a day or two? What happens if your washing machine breaks? What happens if there are potholes in the road and you can't drive? And you begin to think, oh, this is, well, my husband teases me. He says, everything to you is the end of the Roman Empire. But, but it, it is a very instructive time. It's, it's an interesting thought, the, the, the notion of resilience, because while you, you mentioned uh, early hunter-gatherers, I, I particularly like the Mesolithic and the Gold Cliff site, because I remember Victor's picture of this rather idyllic life. And I know, you know, with our current interest in things like wilding, I've got a feeling that part of the population would rather like us to all go back to the Mesolithic and, and, and gently make our way along the edges of the coast in muddy places and live in that style. I wonder, Carenza, something like the, the Gold Cliff site, people living in that way, is it slightly, one, can one feel optimistic that mankind can live in a different way and not need all this stuff? Can we actually reverse and be hunter-gatherers again? Or how do we do that? Ooh, uh, well, you want to be asking a um, psychologist about that, probably rather than a group of archaeologists. That, uh, I mean, yes, human beings are capable of surviving in those sorts of environments. Whether any of us would be capable of surviving in those conditions, I very much doubt. Um, I suspect if we were faced with it, it would take generations just to adapt because humans are naturally inclined to try and hang on to what they've got and recreate or sustain what it is they know and I think um, you know it's you need generations really to pass where people stop trying to create their world in the in the in the sort of shape of what they know from the past and I mean Helen talking about the end of the Roman period is you know the work 
I've done in sort of you know medieval villages where we're excavating sort of you know we're recovering whatever's there and you know you, you see that the settlements the places that produce Roman and early Anglo-Saxon pottery do not produce any Middle Anglo-Saxon or hardly any Middle Anglo-Saxon pottery hardly any later um, you know not until probably 800 years later are people starting to reoccupy those sites when we get larger villages starting to appear in the sort of 850s, 950s, they're avoiding the sites where there's Roman pottery, even hundreds of years later. And Roman settlements are big, and there's lots of, you know, we've done millions of them on time team, and, you know, they're big, they have lots of pottery, you know about them if you're on them. You don't miss them when you're digging a test bin, all these good pottery is reasonably easy to see. Um, and the settlements are big. If you put your, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th century villages down at random in the landscape, you'd expect to hit a Roman settlement fairly often. But actually, only 9% of the test pits we've dug produced more than a couple of sherds of pottery. And that's out of 2,500 test pits. And it's, it's almost as if, you know, I'm not one for long-term conspiracy theories, really, but I just think it's almost as if these spaces are being deliberately avoided, and whether that's because of the sort of conversion to Christianity and you've new, got a new ideological model for avoiding earlier places, or whether it's the impact of something like the sixth century Justinianic pandemic, which made them unlucky, or whether it's just because they were part of a, a failed society or a society which by then had been perceived of as having failed and they're avoided, but it has that long tail. So I think whether we could survive in the Paleolithic, yeah, Phil probably could. Um, but even so, we get awfully used to, you know, painkillers for arthritic limbs or, you know, God, dentistry, um, you know, <laughs> obstetrics. I know that wouldn't bother you guys and probably don't bother on me anymore. But, you know, it, it's all the stuff that, you know, child mortality rates, one of my really interests is, is childhood archaeology. And, you know, we've dug lots of graves of children. I remember you know, that Hillfort site where we found that little baby grave. Um, and, you know, they're not uncommon. Child mortality rates are horrendously high. You know, perhaps only 50% of people who are ever born ever survived to the age of 18. It's a terrible price to pay. And, you know, we are paying a huge price for the privilege we have. I mean, I wonder if I, you know, I don't know if I'd have survived infancy. I had a gastric infection when after I was born. Probably wouldn't have made it, you know. The odds are certainly that certainly two of the four of us here wouldn't have done. So, yeah, I like to think I'd be able to survive, but actually, realistically, I don't think I would. And, and even if we did survive, there, there would be such a horrible transition through the, the end of these things where you're fighting for resources. Yes. It is absolutely horrible. Even if even if you think that by the end of it you might be able to go for a lovely walk in some pristine countryside, fighting for a glass of water before you got to that point would be so horrific that even the smallest resources like like clean water that we we, we take for granted because we have had it for so long we don't realise what work goes into simply that, let alone food, let alone cleanliness, let alone live children. Um, I know. Yeah. I, I remember our house around about series four or five of Time Team uh, into Cambridgeshire and bought a house on a hill, not really thinking about flooding, but kind of aware that it might not be a bad idea and obviously sea levels, blah, blah, blah. We moved house again about four years ago to Lincoln. Again, Lincolnshire's quite low line. We live on top of a hill in Lincoln. Um, and the, but actually, the problem isn't really whether your house gets flooded or not, it's defending your property from the, you know, sweeps of people who have been flooded out and want to come and, you know, use that space. Yeah, and I think that, 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 that turmoil, and, you know, you look at the end of the Roman period, again, there's climate change then, um, that the medieval period when you've got that climate change, again, anything that introduces instability does bring in that sort of, you know, trial of strength, really, and society very quickly collapses. I think we've rather begun to paint a somewhat dystopian picture of archaeological transition. And I've I'd read too much Margaret Atwood. <laughs> I'd rather hoped that in a discussion of archaeology in which we have a kind of long scope of history, I think it's one of the big advantages of, of looking at the past through all these transitions. You know, what was, 
the most dystopian, as you painted it, transition, the loss of the Roman Empire, um, that industrial archaeology, industrial revolution period. Um, I wonder, uh, Stuart, you've got anything slightly more optimistic to consider about survival? You're, you're up in the north there with your lead mines. And what, what did they do with the lead mine, the, the material that came out from that, that mineral deposits? How did they balance the soil back again? Or did it just all flush down to the sea? Well, that's a, that's a, a particularly good question, Tim, because up until um, probably about 10, 12 years ago, I don't think we did really know what, what the impact of all that waste material was, but increasingly we, we do. And what we've discovered is that the, the, the lead ore is taken out the ground but it's, it's um, processed on the surface, it's dressed, it's dressed on the surface. And in the prehistoric period, the dressers used to just hit it with something and, and bits would break off and they'd take away the ore. And as time moved on, we got more and more efficient at taking more and more of the, the mineral out of the rock. But all the waste that was left behind still had bits of zinc and lead and arsenic and all these sort of it. And the more efficient we got, the finer the particles got that were left behind. And over time, they sort of settled in, into like a big sponge, basically soaking up the rainwater and so on. Uh, and the smaller the particle, the easier it is it's picked up in, in solution. And then as the precipitation <laughs> events explode, this stuff just seeps into the soil, it seeps into the river channels, and eventually it seeps in, even into the fish, into the North Sea. Minerals from the North Pennines have been traced into the gut of sea off um, South Shields in, in the North Sea, for instance. So the, the sort of impact of all this is, is, is really difficult to assess until you know where this waste is. And, and that's what archaeologists, I think, can do better, even, dare I say it, than environmental scientists. Um, because we know what to look for over time, rather than just relying on one single um, research strand, as it were. And I, I think increasingly, archaeology and archaeologists have a massive role to play in how how we, we value the environment, how we feed into the environmental debate, for instance. And, and the environmental debate is on the, is on the desk of politicians, is on the desk of local councillors. Um, the more and more we, we can steer the, the sort of academic thinking and research into everyday language and everyday um, um, seeding it out into the population. That was one of the things that I thought that Time Team was particularly good at, is taking complex subjects and passing them on to, for people to absorb. You're elastic slipping, uh, Stuart. Oh, am I slipping even further down, dear? <laughs> I let there you go, because it was all fascinating stuff, but you were gradually going sinking upwards if you it's like. like it's like the interest in my topic to be gradually before it, before it falls down you fall asleep um i remember we did it we did a program with with mick long long time ago in which we were in a kitchen and he said if you took the average set of of you need to just tilt it down a bit stew you and i've now got the opposite effect which is that's it How's that? um mick said you know if you took our average range of materials we have around us buried us with it and then dug us up in 200 years, you'd sort of end up thinking that these people probably came from Japan or, or in our case, China. And I think, you know, globalization, the interconnectivity, I was very pleased to find recently that they'd done some studies on Bronze Age tin and gold in Germany and discovered they came from Cornwall and ingots in Israel have been found to come from tin uh, from Cornwall, and that that the, the landscape in which we are interconnected and therefore bring in influence from overseas is one aspect that that I think has changed. But you mentioned environmentalism, uh, the environment, environmental archaeology, and 
I rather remember in the early days of Time Team, it was always quite difficult to get an environmentalist, someone who would talk about the, the grasses, the earth, the insects and things like this. And I'm going to come to each of you. I'm going to give you a bit of time to think about it. Is there one animal, insect, tree, bug, green thing or crawly thing that in a way you've come across in your archaeological uh, time that makes you think about the transitory nature of, of the natural life and what we may have lost and what we're losing currently. Um, Helen, I'm going to come to you because I think you have some green credentials somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I think that I would go for the pollarded oak um, because this looks to most people like an entirely natural thing, but of course it's not. It's, it's only alive today because human beings have pollarded it and therefore it kind of um, resets the clock when you pollard or coppice the tree and, um, and, and it keeps it young in a sense. It keeps the ratio of leaf to trunk uh, quite high so it can continue to, to survive. So uh, a human being has to do it, otherwise it wouldn't exist. And a human being um, does it only in specific places. So if you map out your pollarded oaks, you can see where you've got field boundaries, uh, often made bigger boundaries than just fields as well. They, they mark out, I mean, you have them, don't you, Stuart, on an old uh, ordnance survey maps. Sometimes mm. it says pollarded oak or pollarded elm. Of course, the pollarded elms we can't see any longer because they've all died because of Dutch elm disease. Um, but they were considered important enough to put on ordnance survey first edition maps to mark parish boundaries um, and so on and so forth. So if you, you can treat this ostensibly natural thing as a as a pure artifact as an archaeological signpost and when you realize how old some of them are um, not necessarily by using biological techniques but by using standard archaeological techniques you can work out that some of them have got to be at least 600 years old say you've got a park and you've got a pollarded oak in that and it's been imparked over a village you would not have needed to produce to do the pollarding after the village had gone. So you take this thing and you realise that it's however many centuries old and that gives an antidote to this idea that, that, that um, this, this lack of a long view, this feeling that well, we, well we've always lived like this. Actually no we haven't always lived like this. It wasn't that long ago that we were living in a different way um, we were living in a different way in the medieval period, we were living in a different way in the Neolithic in the Mesolithic, etc. It, it's only a few jumps back using that pollarded oak as, a, as the first jump, maybe. Uh, and and I, I think I'd use that to, to say that life has been different and uh, we changed from then and we can change again now. We don't have to keep living in this uh, unsustainable, completely unsustainable way. If we think about it, we, can, we don't have to go back, we don't have to uh, suffer the appalling transition that we might if we don't manage it properly we can actually we are you know authors of our own destiny we can do something and in uh, we can continue uh, in the next 600 years or the next lifespan of this pollarded oak uh, we, we can change things so that we can sustain this many people on this small blue planet and, and we don't have to go back to the to the horrible days of conflict and struggle over resources um, well, I was going to think about snails, but being as Helen's gone for plant-based life, I think I'll, I'll, I could follow suit in that case. And I guess pollen, um, uh, I think, has to be such a fantastic indicator for archaeologists. Um, uh, you know, it's tiny, it's essentially microscopic, um, so you simply can't really see it, but it can tell you so much about the way the landscape was used, what sort of vegetational cover there was, how that changed over time. Um, and you can also get it to a sort of range of scales, so you can look at quite localised environments and then you can look at sort of stuff that's blown in from further afield. So you can look at uh, the impact of well, the end of the Roman period in Britain, or the um, you know the the kind of population decline after the 14th century pandemics, and and see the impact of uh, places that were previously cultivated being uh, well rewilded, perhaps <laughs> um, at the very least uh, going back to pasture. In many cases, they're genuinely rewilded. There's a return to forestation, certainly places of 
in Scandinavia, there's work that's been done recently where you know you can see forests being re-established. Um, and pollen gives us this, this perspective that um, again, yeah, it just shows that things can change and people can adapt. And I mean, yeah, Helen's absolutely right. If we could just take reassurance in a way that the I mean, our problem is that we talk about we have lived like this, and of course, none of us actually have, because none of us have been living in any way, shape, or form for more than 20 years. Um, and, um, you know, so we haven't lived really in any other sort of way. Um, but actually, if we could take some sort of reassurance from looking at the archaeology and looking for these pollen sequences that can show change and adaptation, um, and if we could identify where we want to be, then we could work out how to get there without experiencing all the turmoil in the middle. You know, if we can get a navigated route to somewhere where people don't have to worry about having to fight to hang on to what appears to be a diminishing resource, where people can actually think we are managing our way to people having um, an equitable division of stuff and everyone will be okay and nobody's babies have to die, sort of type thing. But, you know, it is there, we have to, and that's the thing about archeology, span isn't it? We, we, uh, I mean, Stuart says it has the answers. I think it's very interdisciplinary, actually. I think we don't need to think of it as archeology span or environmental scientists. I think we, we, we think about it in terms of people working together and archeologists were all kind of fairly interdisciplinary anyway. Um, and, uh, so, you know, if we can work with geographers and environmental scientists and historians, um, you know, Richard Jones' work looking at um, flooding references in Anglo-Saxon charters is giving us perspective on how the landscape's changed. Um, sorry, it's taking me away from pollen a little bit here, but <laughs> I think the fact that we can see how, how resilient landscapes can be should. We, we do have the knowledge now. We should be able to persuade people of an achievable goal that people can work positively towards. Um, and it's ironic, really, that something as tiny as a pot, grain of pollen should be able to do that. Yes, it, 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 it deserves it, its star status, I think. Yeah. It? I, it, and it's just what we are able to see now is the beauty of those individual grains. We've been looking at a site recently, an Iron Age site, where we're We've been looking at the details of the possibility of wet sieving, where we can actually see those transitions. And when we talk about plants, I think of many of those sites we've dug where we've discussed, was it spelt or was it wheat or was it oats or barley? And you see the difficulties of growing something like wheat in certain parts of the country and how oats spelt rye became used. And you can see that change over time. Um, which is us adapting, which I think is quite a positive idea. Um, Stuart? Um, I'm, I'm going off piece a little bit here, I think, Tim, but, but I'm going for the great crested newt, my, 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 my favourite. And that, that, that's because of um, what it represents and, and it reared its head, if that's the right term, during one of our time team programmes, if you remember, a Roman site. Well, it was, an, it was a, an Iron Age hill fort, actually, with a Roman, lots of Roman uh, settlement around the edge of it. But almost the entire logistics of the programme, where we could dig, where we could put the tents, where we could park the cars, where we could walk, was governed by the fact there was great crested newts on that site. Uh, and it it had everything. We had, we had, it was almost like the crest, great crested new police force on site the whole time, um, patrolling where you were going and what you were doing. But what that, what that great crested new uh, does for me, uh, on, on a more serious note, is, is represent um, just how important it is that we do protect and look after what environment we have and that if we can contribute in any way as archaeologists to the understanding of that then it's almost our duty to do so it's it's not just about finding stuff about the past to me that that's an old view of archaeology the, the view of archaeology is what what how could it help us for the future and the great crested news on that occasion the more and more it, it, it figured in the conversations I was listening to from, from, from Helen and Carenza and this sort of image of a newt kept appearing because 
it, 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 it's the value it's the value that we place on things and this whole COVID period is almost an illustration of that in that it's a wake-up call it's a wake-up call for almost everything from how we manage the land to how we look after ourselves to how we look after the natural environment and how we look after the climate so I, I'm I, as my as my sticky tape slightly wobbles again I'm going for the great crested newt it's a bit like archaeology supplying the canary in the mine, isn't it? That there's sites out there that if you could say, look on this and think about it, um, this is something serious you ought to learn from. There's an example in the Americas where some archaeologists did some work on a site where there were nesting birds and they'd been there forever. And when they were digging the sites, which were, I think, early medieval sites, when they actually excavated the middens, they found the eggs of the birds, the egg shells, but not the bones. And it seemed to be clear that these people had established over time that it was a good idea not to eat the bird, but just collect the eggs. And that population of birds, and I can't remember the name of it now, but that population has survived and thrived and still produces eggs. And sometimes, uh, it's that lack of greed about wanting more. If it's supplying the eggs, why kill the bird? Um, and there's lots of sad cases where we've done the opposite. But archaeologically speaking, it was rather nice because, as I say, the middens were just shells. Um, Helen, uh, one site you would like people to look at environmentally um, or from the point of view of climate change that makes you think, look at this, I'm thinking, I'm going to come up with one while you're having a think, was Dunwich. I remember... I was going to mention Dunwich. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll come back to you, Helen, on Dunwich. But I remember Stuart and I standing on the cliffs and Stuart doing his landscape stuff and looking down on the sea and effectively there, out not far beyond the beach, was, was a, a reasonably large town sunk beneath the waves. And to know what that meant to those people, uh, that seemed to me a, a memorable thing. It was a memorable time team. So, Karenza, you know about Dunwich? Well, yes, because I did some excavations at Dunwich in 2015, um, several years after you guys were there, and I wasn't on the time team uh, at Dunwich, uh, the time team. Um, but we did some digging there and discovered a, um, we were digging between the Friary site and the sea, of which there was even less of it left than there had been when you were there, of course, because it's, it hasn't eroded hugely in those 10 years or whenever it was, the gap. Um, but, you know, it was certainly eroding away. And we discovered there was a 40 metre surviving stretch of the medieval town surviving on the cliff top, just between the dog poo bin and the end of the cliff place. Um, and, um, you know, we just did one slot trench across it and found absolutely stacks of medieval pottery in two floor horizons um, and the edge of a hollowway and so on. Um, so if there was one site I'd really like to go back to that really speaks about climate change, uh, for me it would be Dunwich. And we were really keen to go and dig more of this site because we then did a test pit in the um, garden of one of the houses just the other side of this hollowway. There was a lot of medieval pottery there as well. We didn't big enough to find any floor surfaces there but um and we were really keen to go back but the I mean, we were going to get lottery money to do it or you know the original digger the lottery funded and um but local people there was a kind of campaign against it because people were terrified if we did any digging on the top of the cliff it would collapse the cliff which of course you can't we dug underneath the cliff it might not have done it any good <laughs> you know so it it kind of it, it, it's sad and you know if I could go back to one place I would like to do that because that 40 meter stretch we know the surviving medieval town structures there and we know they won't be there in a few years time and the erosion of that coastline is terribly unpredictable so you'll get some bits of it within a mile or so of each other and one bit will be eroding really fast meters a year and the other one bit will be absolutely stable and then they'll switch so we don't know how long that last little bit of Dunwich Town, which was the sixth biggest city in England in the 11th century. You know, we've no idea how long it's going to be there. And at the moment, it's just being lapped by the sea and is an absolute, it epitomises that sort of uh, climate change. The only thing that will save it is that dam they're proposing across from Scotland to Norway, 
Um, I can't see that being target built anytime soon, but it would be an interesting. Uh, that would be brilliant because we could then go and dig Doberlan. Yes, very memorable, uh, Dunwich. That that site uh, is there. Helen, is that uh, any thoughts on the site that tells the story for you? Well, I'm, I'm still just amazed. I didn't realise, Karenza, you were digging there. I was there three weeks ago. Uh, we had a, I had a birthday outing to the beach and we thought that Dunwich would be the place where there, was, there were fewest people because we really didn't want to risk a kind of Bournemouth situation. And there was literally nobody at Dunwich. Um, at, but it, it, just walking along there, I know the very dog poo bin, just walking <laughs> along is quite nerve wracking. Actually, uh, actually in, um, digging a hole, yes, terrifying. I can quite see why the locals are worried. You would have to reassure them in many ways with lots of civil engineers, I think. But, but yes, as you say, fantastic to be able to, to salvage something before it goes. Yeah, the floor surfaces, you know. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, you would, wouldn't you? A absolutely. Um, it, it, it's all, it, it all was there. It was just like at Cove Hive, slightly further up. The road just goes straight off the cliff. Um, and, and it brings it home in a way that nothing else does. Uh, but uh, but the, the, I suppose the, the, the ones that always get me um, about how much we have doctored our landscape are those ones like Borsey where uh, Henry and Stuart um, bring in some water, you know, uh, these things were, that we know in, in one part of our brain, we know that they're, they're Anglo-Saxon islands because they end in E, the, the place name like Borsey, E meaning I, island. But it's not until you uh, look at the relief um, and uh, sea levels and so on that you realise what they'd have looked like before the, uh, the, the drainage systems that we've put in. Um, and if you if you uh, dig any holes anywhere around me, you find masses and masses and masses of field drains. The whole place, I'm on the heavy clay of central Suffolk, the whole place has been drained within an inch of its life. And that has completely changed the way we use the landscape uh, uh, at, because we can farm now in places where we would have been sailing and our transport because of course we've, we've taken away um, our, our water courses and replace those with railways and roads. Um, so, so I'd go for, for somewhere like, like Borsey. Um, I'm trying to think of any other E's that we've dug up, but, um, but, but there, there is just... There Ely. Is Sorry? Ely. Ely. The, well, yes, Ely, Island of Eels. Uh, the, there's, there's so many of these little, um, little islands with, um, with, uh, uh, often a ritual focus on the top, but also an economic focus on the top, uh, because you can get to them easily by sea. They're they're obvious. You can you can trade, um, and you've got a market from your monastery, which ironically is supposed to be isolating itself on a lonely, deserted island. Uh, but of course, it's actually in the middle of European trade. So I'd go for one of those. Stuart. Well, I, I, I know it's quite interesting in, in Helen's point there about the sort of change in landscape and draining and so on. Because, I mean, that is a major factor now in, in the flooding that's, that's taking place in certain parts of the country, and particularly in Yorkshire, where, where because of the sort of intensive agriculture, drains have been added into fields, fields have been, uh, their boundaries have been taken away. You've almost got prairie landscapes. And when you do get large uh, precipitation events, all, the, all this rainfall just flushes the soil away mm. and it very rapidly enters the main river courses and cause, ra causes rapid flooding just by changing the field boundaries and changing the natural flow of water. Meandering rivers and streams as they used to be slow down the way water gradually gets into the river systems and that whole change in landscape, how you manage it economically has this massive impact on, 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 on what we perceive as climate change issues and some of them are actually just draining. But they, to, for a particular site, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I yeah. know yeah. Me and you have talked about this yeah. before Tim, uh, again I, I'll just realign, I'll realign the tape. We can um, all come it, together and buy you a phone holder of some description. <laughs> So, you were, yes, in the middle of flooding. Sure I've just had a little message come up on my screen. It says your internet connection is, un, is unstable, not my <laughs> um, I like the idea, Stuart. I, I think you mentioned hedges there. 
<laughs> and, and, and one of the big things I remember the first when I was doing time science with Mick, um, and he mentioned it, and he oft, we often talked about it, particularly in Devon and Cornwall, those huge hedge banks that divide up the fields, which are often the oldest things in the uh, environment. And they have that tremendous quality of, of stopping water flowing across the surface, and they break up the landscape. And those big landscapes we see with huge hedge lines, just plains of, 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 um, of, of fields with no breakup in them, just somehow looks like a recipe for disaster. There's a couple of other sites, time team sites, that this made me think of. One is Dear Francis's site at Flag Fen. Um, are we all going to have to get used to living in a slightly muddier, wetter environment, in which case have lots of conversations with people who know about Bronze Age timber and surviving in the wetness. And the other is sites like Sea Henge, where those sites on, on the margins of this landscape that we're now introducing, are we becoming a place where there are more margins, where the sea meets the land? And there, there at Sea Henge, we had a, a monument that, in a sense, stood in that transition between the sea and the land and archaeologically told us about the huge forests that had once existed to make those timbers and there's a kind of a, a, a rather sort of nostalgic past being represented there of both people who lived and survived in that area and also built sites like that on the margin uh, not quite as much a margin as when we went to it but somehow halfway between so in general, I'm going to ask you how you feel uh, after you've finished your somewhat dystopian view archaeologically. Uh, any positive thoughts and, and any general views about what archaeology could do in the future to help monitor this process that, 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 that we're all going through this change? Helen? Ooh. Well, there are, there are things like um, the work that's been going on at Star Car over the last few years, where you've taken a classic waterlogged site from the Mesolithic, um, which has only survived because the, the wonderful organic survival is only there because it's, it's waterlogged. And that is now drying out uh, because archaeological sites can't be in isolation from the wider agricultural um, regime. And if the whole if the whole of that area is being drained, then the whole of that area is going to dry out. And, and like with Dunnage falling off the cliff, Starcar has to be excavated while it's still there and you can watch it disappearing as uh, year by year. Um, so sites like that, I think, are, are very useful in that they allow us to understand in real time um, what, how fast this is happening. Uh, because global warming itself Climate change is happening, you know, it's happening fast in a way, but, but looking out of the window, it, it doesn't feel like it's happening fast. But when you look at somewhere like Star Car, you can really see uh, how, uh, how fast what we're doing is affecting our land, which we all depend upon. And hopefully you could work out that it's also affecting our atmosphere. Um, so I, I think I'd go, I, I'm someone who has such a big emphasis on, on flooding, uh, which isn't, isn't uh, something that usually concerns us in the summer when we're talking about this. We usually only remember about it in the winter. But, but that, I think, is, is, it, it is so tremendously important, not just that, that uh, a more unstable climate can, uh, it causes these uh, precipitation events, did you call them, Stuart? Um, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll use that one. Um, it, it's not just that, it's that our, the way that we're interacting with the land, the way we're extracting uh, so much surplus from our agriculture, the way that farms are, are now businesses rather than, uh, and, and look like they're going to be businesses even though politicians say that they want them to be uh, managed for, for public goods. Um, th these, these things are going to conspire and join up to mean that, um, that uh, we're, we're doing uh, unsustain unsustainable things to what we all depend on, which is our landscape and our environment. And so, so yes, St Star Car is not a time team site, but um, I suppose I'll have to think of something like maybe Athelney, if more, uh, I mean, that's another of those classic island sites, which is going to be ringed with 
uh, waterlogged stuff like the Sweet Track, that famous uh, wooden prehistoric track that's again only survived because of waterlogging, you can see what we're losing at Star Car. Somewhere like the Somerset Levels, you can't see what we're losing because we're not looking. So I, I would make a plea for doing a bit more looking. Carenza? Um, I think there's, I do think there's a positive message in archaeology because that long term view does tell us that actually, as a species, we are, we are very capable of surviving. Um, and you look at something like um, medieval field systems, so you look at things like strip lynchets and medieval strip fields, um, which actually are very efficient use of the landscape and reduce runoff, um, particularly strip lynchets around the fields, um, they enabled intensification to take place in a sustainable way. And you've also got the sort of message after the, the Black Death and the population collapse in the 14th century, you know, that that is evidence, you know, you can see that in environmental records, in cores, you know, there's a reduction in lead pollution, you know, in many parts of Europe that is caused because there are fewer people mining and fewer, uh, less demand for products. Um, and, uh, you know, and then the discovery of America has an impact on silver availability and that again has an actual quite positive beneficial environmental effect. Um, so I think that there is, there is a story that, you know, we we can survive and we we are able to adapt and i think that you know psychologists that look at notions of, of sort of continuity and place attachment and that, those sorts of things and actually that notion of continuity uh is something that archaeology can offer people just you know within their own lifetime so we're having to cope with the prospect of change and there are communities that will have to be abandoned within the next 20 years probably because they're simply not sustainable on the coast um, and actually that has happened in the past and you know people have you know moved and led you know there are positive things that come out of that and I think there are there are good stories there that um, will help people cope with um, change and the prospect of change which is unstable so I think archaeology has a lot of good stories about human endurance and resilience to offer. I think the difficulty though is that if you've a, a site like Dunwich, a place like that, a village like that, you can in theory move, but I'd love to see somebody trying to move London. <laughs> okay, that's probably a bit late in this conversation to take <laughs> on the prospects of moving a city, but um, yes, I can see your point. Uh, <laughs> Stuart, well, they're you? doing it, which is that Far East Asian city. It's, it's not, is it Jakarta or um, somewhere like that? They are actually going to move it, aren't they? It's the one that's built on, it's built on a marsh and they are going to create another city and move everyone and that's got God knows how many tens of millions of inhabitants. What a process. Yeah, not sure what the carbon footprint of that project is. <laughs> Stuart, can you get us away from moving cities to um, <laughs> an archaeological site that might give us a bit of hope? Well, yes, I think I think one of the um, it's almost an opposite to the to the issues to do with coastal erosion and losing landscapes like 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 Dunwich, is that there is a there is a, 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 a contradiction to that. There are many landscapes which are actually being silted up on the coastline uh, because of, of different uh, channel flows and estuaries like. The one at Dunster that we, we know well, Tim, where you've got a medieval harbour trapped in land. I've worked on a number of estuaries where changes in dredging over the former coastlines. And I think to some extent, whilst it's quite right that we concentrate archaeology on, on areas that are disappearing, uh, for the reasons that Carenza and, and Helen have, have articulated, but there's also wonderful opportunities in some of these areas that have been silted up for preservation of archaeology and more investigation of those landscape changes while they're going on and some of them are even still in the recent past I, I think is an area that could easily get ignored so I'd like to see a little bit more investment in in mapping and understanding what's going on in those areas that are silting up uh, in an archaeological sense. And uh, it reminds me that on Time Team we spent a few programmes being in Holland and, and the, the, the atmosphere there behind the dikes and in, in, that, in that landscape, uh, doing a Roman barge that had been trading there, that sort of landscape is a people who've adapted over many hundreds of years to living in that environment 
And, and also while you were talking, um, I know the landscape of the Isles of Scilly very well and um, Charles Thomas's work on the drowned landscape of the Scillies. Once there were cairns, settlements, roundhouses, and all sorts of things. And if those people could be living there now, they'd be looking up over five, 10 meters of water. And, and I think we may be entering a period when that the landscape around the edges of our, our country is going to change and the life where we're moving inland, moving away from these cities, uh, uh, as you've mentioned, is going to leave more and more drowned landscapes for archaeologists to look at in the future, which um, is probably not a jolly thought to end on. But I'd like to thank you all for your thoughts uh, and contributions to this CBA event. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, we did manage to find in Time Team some examples of those changes and um, I hope we've managed to introduce some examples of the way archaeology is, in some cases, the only record of what we've done in the past, and therefore it's incredibly important. So uh, keep taking an interest in it. Thank you very much for, or to all of you and those of you who have been listening, and you can look forward to Time Team Tea Times at six o'clock on Sundays, where we all share a program together. So thank you very much, all of you. We'll leave Stuart and his strangely elasticated phone. Uh, Carenza, fairly near to the coast, fairly near to Eli, I think, Ely, and, and Helen uh, for her journeys to Dunwich and the, and the Strangelos landscape. So thank you very much indeed, Time Team, for your contribution. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.